So today I'd like to talk about, um, sort of go back a little bit from analysis and work back towards some of the fundamental basis of the signals we're looking at and hopefully uh, cast a little more doubt on what we're looking at, okay? So I think uh, fMRI has been wildly successful, as most of you know, and, and the main thing is because the, whenever the input seems to go up, the signal seems to go up, okay? So it's a very nice uh, measure. Um, and the other thing is it's got tons of SNR relative to other measures. So it's, it's a great tool, and that's why it's been used so easily, so widely. And so this is a, a, a plot from an early paper by Jeff Boynton and colleagues showing that as contrast goes up on sort of a log scale, signal amplitude also goes up. And this is a paper published with just two subjects, but it's been very influential in terms of sort of setting the tone of why fMRI is useful. And I think that for a lot of the studies, um, so, so most studies assume implicitly that the, F, the bold signal is proportional to brain activity, whatever you, you, know, you mean by brain activity. And I would say that this is probably a reasonable assumption for basic studies of healthy young graduate students and postdocs, typically. Um, but a lot of our interest has been sort of figuring out whether this assumption breaks down as we move into disease studies of disease, medication, and age, things where uh, we may not know what the actual mechanisms are and how they're being affected. So um, as most of you know, it's uh, what we measure are maps like this, and what we're trying to make inference about is the neural response, okay? And between the neural response and the measured signal, there's this huge black box, which we don't really actually understand, okay? Uh, to some extent, we know that neurotransmitters cause vasodilation, increases blood flow, there's increased oxygen metabolism, all those things together cause a change in deoxyhemoglobin, change the local magnetic field, and voila, we measure the bold signal. Uh, so, based on that, um, you know, there are studies where, for example, we look at, this is not bold, but it's deoxyhemoglobin, where we look at, say, young versus elderly uh, responses, and we can argue that perhaps, in this case, the, the older folks have less of a response and potentially slower. Uh, this is a bold signal where um, these trailing edges are, seem to be slower with age. These are some measures of a, um, a young subject here in blue, an older subject in green, and an older subject in green who's just taken coffee, and an older subject in red who, oh no, the, the red is the older subject who has just taken coffee, the green is someone who has not taken coffee. And so the question is what can we make of these differences um, in, in the shape of the response and also the amplitude of the response when we actually know that their baseline physiology is different. Uh, this is another study by Adam Fleischer, uh, currently at Barrows Neurological Institute, where he was looking at subjects with either uh, a low risk for Alzheimer's disease, genetic risk, or high risk. And he actually found that um, in the areas he was looking at, there was a higher bold signal change in the low risk population versus the high risk population. And this, these are the time courses shown here. But there's a, sort of, there's a confound there because their resting baseline blood flow was also significantly different. Where the low-risk subjects had less blood flow, and the high-risk subjects had higher blood flow. And so the question is, is really, can you really interpret this as a change, as a difference in neural activity between these two groups, or is it solely just a matter of their blood flow being different? Okay, what's the correct inference to make? So this is nicely summarized in this paper by Yanetti and Wise, where you can imagine in the schematic you've got some neural response, and N here stands for sort of normal. Uh, some normal signaling and some normal vascular response. And so that would give you a, a, a bold signal uh, shown on the, the right-hand side. So what you would like is, for example, if you have a patient with a greater neural response, everything, uh, assume the signaling is the same and the vascular response is the same, then you might get an increase in your bold signaling extent. Similarly, if you had a drug that would decrease your neural, neuronal response, <laughs> Uh, left the signaling and the vascular response the same, um, then the bold signal might be decreased. Okay? And there your interpretation might be straightforward. But what you're much more likely to find is a patient might have, for some whatever reason, say an, an increased neuronal response, signaling is preserved, and their vascular response is impaired, perhaps because of age. Okay? In which case, the bold signal may not be changed at all, okay? or decreased a little bit. Or you might have a case where drug decreases both the neuronal response and the signaling pathways, 
in which case you have no bolt signal at all, whereas you might have wanted to infer that there was a decrease in the neuronal activity. Okay. Uh, this is another example. So we have three different bold responses here, okay, ranging from the, the greatest response, the lowest response, and the fastest to the slowest. Okay. These are the response, all the response to the same stimulus. Okay. These are all the bold response to the same stimulus. The only difference is here the subject was on 5% CO2. You can get the same effect by breathing into a bag. Okay. Uh, and here the subjects were hyperventilating. Okay. And what happens is when you have hypercapnia, your blood flow is about 30% higher. And when you're in hypocapnia, your blood flow is about 20% lower, or 20 to 30% lower. Uh, we've done a lot of studies using, our, our sort of favorite manipulation is caffeine because it's easy to administrate and it's also got sort of, it's relevant because there's a lot of difference in caffeine usage and, and it's used quite a lot. So we see the same thing with caffeine where, for example, here before caffeine you have this response and after caffeine you have a speeding up of, of the response. Okay, but this is to the same stimulus in the same subjects. Okay. So we, we sort of, when we, when we first look at this, we were sort of trying to understand, well, there's this, counterintuitively, we, we, there, when, when there's a CBF increase, we would have thought that everything would speed up. And instead, we found that things slowed down. Okay. With either caffeine or hypocapnia, there's a CBF decrease. If you've just had a cup of coffee, you've probably lowered your blood flow by, by about 30% to your brain. Okay, yes? Uh, if you drink caffeine, what happens is all your adenosine receptors become upregulated, okay? And therefore, when you're without caffeine for, say, 12 to 24 hours, uh, your blood flow is increased about 30% over uh, what it would be without caffeine, which is why a lot of sometimes people get headaches. And in fact, the main reason that they found that people keep drinking coffee is to avoid the side effects of withdrawal. Okay, sort of it's sort of that's the, the main reason. <laughs> I mean, aside from the pleasures of drinking coffee, but that's it's a strong stimulus to keep drinking the coffee. So if you're scanning frequent users or they've had coffee, will, will you still see the effect on the response? Or not? Oh, yes. If you, if, you, if you have someone who, it depends on when you scan them. For example, if, they've, if you scan them first thing in the morning before they've had their cup of coffee and you give them caffeine, you'll see this effect. If they've already had their caffeine and you give them more, then they're already saturated, so you won't see it. So yeah, it's a confound in terms of where, when you scan them. Yeah. Um, so we found that when blood flow was decreased, there was a faster response, which sort of we didn't quite understand at first because with lower blood flow, lower blood velocities, we thought things would be slower. And in fact, they were faster. And with aging, we know that blood flow decreases. And here we found a slower response. So in this case, we have two cases where blood flow decreases. One makes things faster, one, thing, one makes things slower. And so um, what we did was we sort of looked back at um, trying to, un we asked whether there was a single explanation that could explain these different observations. And what we went back to was this looking at, well, what, what are the arterioles actually doing? So what's happening when you actually have activation? And, and essentially, to first order, what you're working with is something where you've got the smooth muscle around the arterioles, which can either constrict or expand to let more blood flow through. But there's also this sort of connective tissue layer outside, which is you can sort of think of as something that's um, th this sort of uh, non-responsive part, okay? This, this thing that's just connective tissue. And so that's not responding to your neural stimulus. And so what happens is that um, you can imagine it's sort of like a balloon, okay? If you, if you, or if you had this balloon where you're blowing air into it, in and out, and you can make it go uh, smaller or bigger. But as you blow that balloon up quite a bit, then now as you're putting air in and out, it's not going to respond as much. When the balloon is quite collapsed and you put air in and out, it's very responsive, okay? These are just curves showing this. You can go through and look at the stress and the strains and, and, and figure this out. and, and all. There's a nice biomechanical explanation for that, which um, this picture just shows, for example, when you're here, there's a lot more stress taken up in, in the sort of the non-responsive part, okay? Sort of similar to the balloon where most of the stress is just taken up by this sort of non-responsive non part. And so when you ask it to move, it's not doing anything, 
Um, and then when the vessels constrict, um, less stress is taken up by this connective tissue part. The vessels are much more responsive to, your, to the neural signaling and uh, you get a faster response. So it turns out you can actually model this. Um, I'm not going to go through the details of the model, but we're able to find very nice fits of the, these are the data and some of the models. And in these models, what we did was we sort of constrained it so that everything had to be the same across conditions except for the blood flow. Okay, so we didn't let ourselves tweak the parameters to overfit. And so uh, we could fit both the sort of the, the effect of hypercapnia and, and hypocapnia. And I'm not going to go into it, but we can also sort of fit the effects of aging. And the, the point is not to sort of explain the model too much, but just to argue that uh, oftentimes when we see a difference in the bold signal, that there is a different, there's an explanation for it that has nothing to do potentially with the neuronal, neuronal level. Okay? Uh, another big assumption that's made in fMRI is linearity. Okay? Probably every analysis we've talked about this weekend has assumed linearity. And by linearity, I mean linear time and linear, linear, linear shift invariant system. Okay. Um, so most analysis assume that we have some stimulus pattern and we're convolving it with a linear kernel. Okay. And we get our output. Okay. And this was also really influenced by that 1996 paper by Jeff Boynton and colleagues where they showed that the first order things are linear. Now there are, for those of you who are familiar with the fMRI literature, um, at least for the sensory areas we know that the, the bull signal is quite nonlinear. Okay. And yet to do the nonlinear analysis is so much more uh, uh, complicated that people just sort of assume that it's, it's linear. And linearity has, has been sort of useful assumption. Uh, we decided to look at sort of linearity by uh, following up some work by Carl Friston and, and looking at what's called a second order Volterra, Volterra kernel expansion where in addition to the uh, linear terms, we added a second order nonlinearity. Okay, so this model is at least a first order nonlinear interactions between stimuli. All right. And so if you had, for example, some stimulus pattern like this and some bold response like this, it turns out that you can actually analyze that data um, and, and look at the nonlinearities directly. And so you can end up with an estimate of both your first order kernel, okay, similar to what you get with a linear analysis, but you also get the second order kernel here where you can start looking. And, and if there was no nonlinearities, this would all be zeroed. And the fact that um, there are nonlinearities means that there's this sort of non-uniform area here indicating that there are, there are some uh, nonlinearities in the system. So once again, what we did was we used our favorite uh, thing, which was caffeine, okay? And we, we asked the question, how does caffeine affect linearity? And, uh, and our hypothesis was that caffeine sort of moves us away from this nonlinear sort of boundary of the vessel. And so that with caffeine, the system should become more linear, okay? And so we tested that by giving folks caffeine. Uh, these are the linear kernels here. Blue is before and green is after. But what I want you to focus on are these, these um, nonlinear kernels, these second order kernels, where uh, you can sort of see there's a lot more red and yellow in this kernel here than in this kernel here, okay? Indicating that the linearity has increased here. It's not as nonlinear, in other words, okay? And we, you can statistically test this across subjects and you find that it is significantly, there's a significant increase in linearity with caffeine because it's driving the system into this more linear operating region. And the effect of that is here, if you were to do a linear analysis of your data, okay, of that sort of stimulus pattern I showed you, this would be the estimate of the bold response you would obtain. Okay. And if you were to do a nonlinear analysis, this is the estimate you would be, you would be attaining. Okay. And so, for example, there are studies out there that try to interpret the, the width of the, the bold response, the, the delays of the bold response. And so, any analysis that depends on that for inference would be very sensitive to this difference, okay? So it's just saying how you analyze the data actually makes a difference in your estimate if, you, if the dynamics are nonlinear, okay? So uh, the nice thing though is, and, and potentially this is good for uh, coffee drinkers, is on caffeine, the difference between the linear estimate in red and the uh, nonlinear estimate are much more similar, okay? So um, yes? Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. 
Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, these were all done in the visual cortex with a pretty you know, strong stimulus. Um, so it's probably the worst case scenario where it's, it's a very strong flashing checkerboard, full contrast um, checkerboard. And um, um, it's probably, I, my guess is it's probably less pronounced in non-sensory areas. But that's also because of the fact that you can't actually drive those systems as hard or as coherently. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, so the point is not necessarily that, I mean, this is sort of a cute, like, fact, right, that maybe everyone should be on caffeine when you do your fMRI studies. Um, uh, but also, it's also just pointing out the fact that the, uh, you know, not surprisingly, if, if we analyze the data in a way that doesn't fit the models, then we're going to get incorrect estimates. Okay. Okay, so what I want to now focus on is, um, Another area that we've been sort of interested, which is the variability, and we've talked a little bit about this uh, this weekend, which is, you know, what do we make of differences in the bold response between subjects, and, and it, can we actually explain it? Uh, this once again is the bold response to visual stimulus, and this is across, I think it's 10 healthy subjects, okay? And it's showing you basically almost a twofold uh, range of, of the bold response amplitude, anywhere about 2% to 4% to change in the bold response. Okay. And the question is, this is the same stimulus, the same brightness, the same contrast. Is this real? Is this true neuronal variability in their response, or is it just due to other factors, such as their difference in baseline blood flow? Okay. So for example, if it, if it was due to something such as baseline blood flow, and you, weren't, you consider that a confound, then perhaps you could uh, take that out as a covariate and improve your statistical power. But if it's related to neural variability, then you'd like to leave it in because it's actually related to what you care about, potentially. Okay, so to do that, and, and the reason why this part of the title here is multimodal imaging, is I'd like to sort of talk a little bit about what you can do beyond bold. Okay, pretty much everything we've talked, to, talked about so far is, is the bold signal. Okay. A lot of our focus has been on getting additional measures of both the baseline state and, and the functional state. One of our uh, things that we've done a lot at UCSD is uh, what's called ASL, or arterial spin labeling, to get a non-invasive measure of blood flow. And we've more recently become interested in uh, non-invasive measures of venous oxygenation. Okay. And I'm not going to have time to talk about it today, but there are methods of working these measures back in terms of getting actually estimates of cerebral uh, metabolic rate of metabolism. Okay. And so the hope is, although it, there's still a ways to go, is if you can get all these three measures, then potentially you can sort of make, start making inferences back to here. Okay. And potentially have a better chance of, you know, if you're doing, say, a dynamic causal model, you know, if you have these additional measures, you could probably argue about estimating this a little better than if you just have this, which is, as you can see, it's fairly far removed from what you want to make inferences about. So because, uh, and then the other thing you can do is uh, to get measures of vascular reactivity, you can also measure the bold signal response to uh, physiological challenges, such as a breath hold or, or carbon dioxide. So the basic idea is to sort of increase your palette of measures to try to understand more uh, the physiological confounds that might affect your interpretation of your data. Okay, so I'm just very briefly going to explain what arterial spin labeling is. Um, it's basically a tracer-based method where we would start off by, essentially, if you think of the proton spins as being up, we invert them with the RF radial frequency pulse. And then the spins just flow. They, we, we invert them down here in the arter arteries, and they just flow up, okay? And as they're floating up, they're, they're relaxing back to their equilibrium. But if we capture the image before they fully relax, then we have the, some signal that's not yet fully relaxed. Okay. And then we acquire another image, which we call the control image, where we let the spins be in their equilibrium state. Okay. And then they just obviously just flow up into the brain. And then we acquire what's called a control image. And if we take the control minus the tag, okay, then the difference this little difference is related to actually how much blood has flown into that region. Okay. And if we could acquire this very quickly, you can see that we could make, if we could acquire it right here, that difference would be quite large, right? Uh, 
The reason we can't acquire it right away is because it takes time for blood to flow into the region, and, and that's sort of a technical challenge that we, we still sort of have. The nice thing is it's totally non-invasive. You can do it over and over again, uh, unlike PET, where it t you have to use tracers. Uh, so these are some data showing some full whole brain maps from a multi-site study that um, we were participating in from sort of showing what these maps look like. Um, there was some talk about databases earlier. We, we're now starting a, a database, an NIH-funded database at UCSD where people can send in all their blood flow data and actually have it analyzed for them. So if anyone's interested, I'm happy to talk to them about that. Okay. okay, the other good thing is you can actually do this pattern of doing tag, control, tag, and control while the person is doing a functional task. And you end up with some time series like that. And if you process the time series correctly, you can actually measure the change in the blood flow with response to a ta in response to a task. And the nice thing is this is all totally non-invasive again. Uh, and then the really cool thing is if you do that, so this is, this is an example of a, of a measurement of, of a time series that we measure where we're doing that. It has both this sort of high frequency modulation, which is that tag control modulation, okay? So if you do a sort of a high pass operation on this data, you get the blood flow data, okay? If you do a low frequency filtering of this data, you get the bold response, okay? And so since they're basically in two different areas of the frequency domain, you're actually getting an independent estimate of blood flow and independent estimate of bold. And so it's a very nice method where you can actually get uh, two, two modalities at once. So why is that of interest? Well, what we're looking at here is the bold response here versus baseline blood flow. Okay. Uh, here there's, um, this is also for that visual task. I believe this is, um, I forget which study this is from, but here, once again, you see almost a two-fold variation in the bold response. And it seems like uh, about 60% of that variance is explained by differences in blood flow, okay. which, would may, which would tend to make you, one interpretation would be a lot of that variance is not necessarily neuronal. It's just the change in their blood flow. Okay. Uh, this is also showing that we can measure the blood flow response, and it also tracks this uh, baseline blood flow. Uh, another measure that we can do is uh, what's called a trust or venous oxygenation measure, where we can now, now we sort of tag the blood and then we let it flow into the veins. Okay, it's very similar to ASL, it's sort of, but we're instead of tagging the blood here and letting it flow into the brain, we sort of tag it while it's in the brain and let it flow out and we can measure it, for example, in the sagittal sinus. And then if we look at what's called the T2 of the blood, we can get a measure of the venous oxygenation. Okay. So that's just shown here where we, we, we sort of acquire two sets of images. The subtraction will then give us a nice image of the blood in the sagittal sinus. Uh, if we fit that to a T2 uh, decay, then we can um, estimate uh, from some curves. We can, from the T2, we can come up with an estimate of the venous oxygenation. And it turns out that the bold response and both the bold response and the blood flow response also are very dependent on the venous oxygenation. Okay, so once again, you have this thing that's, um, you know, sort of an indicator of, of your baseline hemodynamic state that's explaining a lot of variability in your bold signal. Um, and then as you would expect, the baseline blood flow and oxygenation are, show a strong correlation as well. Okay. Yes. Uh, yes, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, we're not quite sure, but it's probably related to the fact that uh, the oxygen extraction fraction depends on the, the velocity of the blood. And, and that's, that seems to be the best argument. So the faster blood moves, the less oxygen can be extracted into the veins, and the, therefore, uh, so therefore you can see that at higher blood flow, okay, there's greater oxygen content but by the time you get to the vein. And that's because there's less time for diffusion of the blood, of, of the um, oxygen into uh, the brain tissue. So more, more, gets it, more gets to the vein. Uh, 
OK, so the last thing we do is we can also have our subject breathe carbon dioxide. And uh, carbon dioxide is thought to increase blood flow without causing an increase in metabolism. So you get these very, very robust bold responses here. Okay. And so what we can do is we can ask the question, well, is the response to carbon dioxide, is that going to be related to the response to uh, a functional task? In this case, this was a memory encoding task, and we were looking at the, the hippocampus. And so it turns out that actually this relationship, depending on how you pick your ROI, and in this case it's picked from an independent run, but um, you, you get these very strong correlations. In fact, if you look at only an ROI where there's both the bold and CBF activation, which is basically picking out the voxels that are pretty well localized to gray matter, you see an R of like 0.98, okay, between the bold response and the hypercapnic bold response, okay, which is um, pretty sort of, I mean, um, and, and these data have, have not been massaged. I mean, it's just really a strong relationship between the bold and the hypercapnic response. Okay. So if you look at this, you'd say, well, my gosh, you know, all the variability I'm seeing is related to just vascular response to hypercapnia. That would be at least one interpretation one might make. Uh, this, the similar things have been found by other groups. Uh, this is the breath hold signal to working me uh, <coughs> memory bold signal. So not, not as quite, uh, this is not a sensory task. So you know, part of it is probably the signal is less, and there's more variability in the working memory response, but still seeing a nice uh, correlation. And you, don't, you can even do this with resting state fluctuations. It turns out that as you're breathing normally, the change in carbon dioxide causes changes in your bold response. And just by looking at how much those are changing, that sort of gives you a non-invasive measure of your uh, CO2 response. And so this is showing uh, resting state um, fluctuations versus breath hold response. Um, and it turns out that you can use these um, resting state fluctuations as sort of a, a proxy for, for a breath hold or a CO2 response. So to summarize, we have all these things. This is from a, data from yet another group showing, for example, uh, bold signal versus baseline oxygenation, bold signal versus blood flow, bold signal versus resting state fluctuation, bold signal uh, in response to um, response to carbon dioxide. Okay. All these things somehow pointing to the fact that maybe something else, maybe something non-neural is driving this variability. And therefore, this is variability that you should take out. And this actually had led to a lot of interest in acquiring these separate measures, using them as covariates, projecting out that variance to reduce your sort of within group variance. Okay. And up to a year ago, I was pretty, I, if you'd asked me about a year ago, I'd say, well, that's great, and, and that you should always do this, and this is the best thing to do, okay? Because you don't want to actually have this, if, if this is undesired variability, that's you know, potentially just due to, if you, look, if you think that this is variability that's just somehow changing the gain of your measurement, then maybe you should just take it out, okay? But um, if you'd sort of step back and look at the data, for example, if you look at this data here where we had the bold versus hyperacapnic bold and an R of 0.98. And let's say you were to do the thought experiment and project out all that variability, then you would basically say, well, the normalized signal is, is just this, the mean of all the, the subjects. And there's very little variance here, okay? And so basically, you would, you'd be arguing that, well, actually, you're sort of led to this conclusion that there's actually no intersubject variability in the, the response, the neuronal response, which is somewhat hard to believe. Okay, so the question is, you know, is this the right answer? Is there really two to four, you know, a hundred percent variability in the bold response, or is it really almost no variability in the bold response? Okay, so to sort of maybe give you a, not a complete answer to this question, but maybe sort of give you some evidence of why you might not buy either argument. But, and, and potentially that the, the picture is much more complicated. And, and um, part of my motivation of presenting it here is maybe one of you has a better explanation of what's going on. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to show you here is a study where, uh, not a bold study, but one where they measured both uh, EEG and optical signals okay, simultaneously. 
And what they found was that the alpha power was related to sort of the, the center frequency. And this is sort of a, a well-known finding in the EEG literature. Okay. So uh, I'm just pointing this out because the, the other graphs are going to look, be plotting versus this frequency. So since this is an inver inverse relationship, just sort of think of flipping the other curves in, in that relationship. The main thing I want you to look at is here, where they're plotting the amplitude of the visual evoke potential versus this frequency. So it has this relationship. But you can also think of this as if you're plotting this as there's alpha power, it would go that way, okay, to first order. Okay. Similarly, if you just plot um, the alpha power over the response versus frequency, it has that inverse relationship as well, okay. Indicating that the, um, the response to stimulus in some sense depends on the resting state EEG power. Okay. Similarly, they didn't look at bold, but they looked at sort of the optical analog of bold, which is, de which is deoxyhemoglobin. Okay. And this has this inverse relationship here. So this means that the bold signal would tend to go up with alpha power. Okay. And so here, there's the next, so this, these are, and this is a total, uh, totally electrical measurement, so there's no vascular compounds here, and yet we're seeing this quite a lot of variability in the, in the response. Okay. So there is evidence now, so, so this is evidence saying, well, actually, uh, wait a second, actually what you were claiming was totally vascular variability is actually probably some of it is still related to the neuronal variability. Okay. Uh, there's other evidence out here, more directly, which is, I think this is the, uh, to an auditory oddball paradigm of um, the EG power, the P300 amplitude versus EG alpha power, showing this sort of response here. So the greater alpha power you have in the resting state, the greater your response to a stimulus will be. Okay. And then, to sort of put everything together, it turns out that um, there is some evidence indicating that there's an inverse correlation between blood flow and alpha power, okay, which all fits in because we're seeing the bold response go up with alpha power and yet go down with blood flow. And so if the alpha power and the blood flow are inversely related, that would all fit together. So we actually have a slightly more complicated picture where the resting state vascular blood flow or oxygenation is probably related to the resting state EEG. Okay, and, and so now we're not sure what's, what's causing the variability. Uh, this is another example showing, for example, this is showing alpha power here, and here's a negative correlation between alpha power and glucose metabolism, which is also related to blood flow. And so all these things are pointing to this, this link between this resting state um, neural activity. So what we have is that, you know, we have this stimulus and we have the neural response and we have this neurovascular coupling, this big black box, and, and we measure bold and other things. And where a lot of the field has been going has been sort of saying, well, a lot of the variability we see is totally due to changes in this vast, it can be explained by changes in this baseline vascular state. Okay, you're tweaking sort of the gain of this system, okay, and so that's causing variability. But um, it seems to be that the, the picture is actually a little more complicated than that because these two things are related, okay, which is once, it's not, it sort of makes sense. I mean, your, your baseline blood flow and oxygenation probably are going to be related to your baseline neural activity, your resting state neural activity. And then what makes it interesting is that this resting state neural activity is actually going to affect your task response, okay. And so now all of a sudden it's not clear what to do, okay. So uh, just to summarize, across subjects, higher alpha power is related to lower CBF. And so um, instead of just baseline blood flow sort of driving this gain here, it could be that what's happening is these are related and the, the, the differences in, in amplitude really do reflect true changes in neural response. Okay? Yes? Uh, it's either, typically it's measured um, with the eyes just closed, so you get a lot of alpha power to look at, or you could have the subject just resting, looking at a, a blank screen with a dot in the middle, but it's without any stimulus. Yeah. Uh, 
So it's it's not. I mean, the the term resting state is not. I mean, it's controversial. So it's like in the in the absence of an explicit task, but obviously the brain's still doing something. When you have alpha with a present stimulus, it's usually mean you're inattentive. That's right. Yes, exactly, <clears throat> exactly. So right. So what we're looking at is not so much within a sub. So certainly within a subject, if you become inattentive, your alpha power goes up. The idea is different people have different alpha power, okay, and with their, eyes <coughs> with their eyes closed, or with their eyes open even, okay. Uh, there are differences in, in the resting state activity, so, which is related, seems to be related to the resting state blood flow, okay. So, you know, you, you can take uh, 10 subjects and you'll have a huge range of their blood flow, and what, do, what does that mean? We're not really sure yet, okay. Yes? So your, your uh, accounts of all Yes. Uh, different areas, but single variable. Yeah. But uh, from the sort of work I do, what we're interested in is uh, whether these kinds of factors affect the joint distribution mm -hmm. differently for different people. So mm -hmm. uh, the second and higher moment. Um, do you have any results about that? Uh, I don't, simply because these sample sizes are actually pretty small. I mean, like. 15, you know, 10 to 15 subjects, and I haven't gone to that level of analysis. Um, we really just focus, right now we're just focused on trying to understand what might be driving it. Um, but, but you're right, and, and I think the intersubject variability is not necessarily the most important thing at this, you know, in terms of it's, it's, it's a good, um, it's a nice sort of platform for trying to understand this because it doesn't re require and this, it doesn't require people who are sick or administering drugs. But the real question comes to clinical application of fMRI, where if you have a bold response that's different in a patient population, you know, how do you actually interpret that? <coughs> Sorry, did, did that, are you? Uh, no, I see you have quite different motives. From that. Okay. I know the mechanism. You want to know how does that interpret Well, I, want, I actually want to know the, mechan the, physio the physiological mechanisms, but I'm probably, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so there's been a lot of interest in either applying, acquiring baseline blood flow or breath hold um, to normalize. Uh, and some of those are actually being applied now. The, the thing is that actually that may be the wrong thing to do. Mm -hmm. Because if the breath hold response is somehow related to blood, the baseline blood flow, and that's related to the resting state alpha power, which is actually causing true changes in neural, neural activity, which we can't measure directly with fMRI, then you may be removing true variability. So there's no way of, uh, uh, from, from the, as a result of your work, there's no suggestion of what I can do as a, take as a measure in order to do this. Well, I think um, it, it would, if, if you could get the resting state alpha power, which more group, I mean, it's more complicated to do, but it potentially, it, it'll be acquiring blood flow and only five minutes left? I started at 40. 20 All right. OK. Uh, we can do that. All right. <laughs> OK. So I guess no more questions. <laughs> OK. All right. So um, let me just end this by, since we're talking about the resting state, uh, I think most of you have sort of uh, uh, heard a little about resting state connectivity. So I'll, I'll just blow through this. <laughs> OK. So the idea is you have a voxel time course. You might low pass filter it. Um, you would then create a reference time course from, say, an ROI in the left motor cortex. This would form your reference time course. You would then correlate that with all other voxels in the brain. You end up with some correlation map like this, which if you wanted to, you could threshold, um, and end up with what's called a, um, a functional connectivity map. So this is all acquired in the resting state, either with your eyes closed or your eyes always open, not performing an explicit task. Okay, so this has received a lot of attention in the literature. It's sort of the latest, one of the hot fads in fMRI. And uh, this is the paper I talked about yesterday by Steve Smith and others showing, um, for example, these are the resting state networks here. And 
Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but just to argue that these were obtained from people just resting, whereas this was the ICA analysis of that 30,000 30, studies in the brain map uh, database. And just arguing that the networks that they found in this paper, they are arguing for a striking similarity between the networks obtained in response to functional tasks as opposed to resting state. And sort of the cool thing is that they can then, for every sort of type of task, they can sort of give a weight into sort of how much each network plays a role in that task. Okay, so break, essentially breaking the brain down into these basis functions of networks and saying that these basis functions are recruited in different amounts for every given task. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of ex potentially premature, but the NIH has already decided to devote $30 million to map the human connectome, of which they are going to be using, uh, and the grant is due next week, okay, uh, high angular resolution diffusion imaging to look at the fiber connections, resting state fMRI to look at the functional connectivity, and some MEG EEG. Uh, even though we don't really understand what this is, the NIH has decided that it's worth spending a lot of money to map this. So one lucky group will get that $30 million to do the mapping of the connectome. Um, I'll skip over this in the interest of time. So one of the sort of the controversial things that uh, I'd, I'd like to end with is um, there is sort of been this thing in the literature by uh, Fox and, and uh, Michael Fox from uh, Mark Rakel's group at WashU arguing that there are these two anti-correlated networks. Um, one is the default mode network, which is also the, the, net, the, the area, the, the network in the brain that becomes deactivated with a cognitive task, and what's called the task positive network or the attention uh, network, which is, tends to be activated. And in the resting state, these appear to be anti-correlated. Okay? And the interpretation is sort of nice in the fact that you've got this brain that it's going between these two networks and, and they're sort of competing networks, and, and what you're, depending on what you're doing, there's going to be different assignment of energy or um, neuronal activity to these two different competing networks. Okay? So it's a nice picture. Now, this is a, the way they get this data is a prime example of double dipping, okay? Because what they do is before they correlate, do these correlations, they compute the global mean from all the voxels and subtract that global mean from every voxel and then do the correlation, okay? So they're using the data twice. Uh, I'll skip over that in the of time. And so Kevin Murphy and P from Peter Banatini's group at NIH argued uh, that this was the wrong thing to do, that uh, if the true distribution looks like this, before you remove the global mean, you remove the global mean, you shift everything down here, and you're inducing negative correlations. So you're, you're putting in negative correlations where there was no negative correlation to begin with. And so you're going to end up with anti-correlated networks no matter what. Okay. And as evidence for that, they say that, well, this is the correlation, the anti-correlated networks you obtain where uh, red and blue are anti-correlated. And this is what you obtain if you use global signal regression, if you do double dipping. And without global signal regression, they claim that they don't find any anti-correlated networks. So the question is, is this just an artifact of the processing, or are there truly these two anti-correlated networks in the brain? So one approach we took is, well, you know, the double dipping thing is pretty easy to avoid, right? I mean, if you're interested in the correlation between two regions, you just you could sample the global signal from all the other voxels outside those two regions. Okay, so you're not using the data twice. And we can go even further and say, well, let's just even see how few voxels you could sample and still see if you get anti-correlation. So, so this is showing you, uh, on this graph, if you didn't do any sort of global signal regression, the, the correlation would be about 0.3. So the positive correlation between, this is between uh, two areas of the brain in the default mode network. Okay. Now, if you just include like half a percent of the voxels that are outside those regions, you end up with a negative correlation, okay? And even if, and, the, and this sort of, this asymptotic curve goes down to at, at just using 1% of the voxels outside of those two regions of the brain, and these are just randomly selected. And then so what we can do is we can look at, you know, the distribution of, of the correlations over random selections of those voxels. And it turns out that, um, you know, even at 1% of the voxels, you're, you're obtaining what you would obtain with almost 100% of the voxels. And it turns out that answer is very close to what you would do if you did the wrong thing. Okay, so this, 
at least we think we're doing something that's not totally wrong. We're not doing double dipping per se because we're de defining the ROIs anatomically. We're saying use these other voxels to, to come up with the estimate of the global mean. Um, and so if you do that, yep, I'm almost done. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you do that, uh, this is without global signal regression. This is doing it the wrong way. So where you see these anti-correlated networks. And this is doing it what we think is not violating the double dipping rules. And, and you sort of still see that anti-correlation. And so, um, and it seems to be the case that, so this is sort of a processing sort of argument, but it also sort of raises an interesting question about the fact that, you know, if half, one half of 1% of the voxels carry all this information, whether, if, if there, what, what is this global signal that's going up and down across the brain? And because when you take out the global signal, you're sort of referencing the networks to that brain state, right? So the question is, um, what's the interpretation of doing that, that global signal regression? Because it does seem to be that um, it is prevalent everywhere. So it's some, there's some up and down of the brain. And then with respect to that, there are these anti-correlations. So um, to conclude, um, so um, I think it's, you know, sort of differences in the fMRI signal should, you should always have in the back of your mind, especially if you're doing, dealing with clinical populations, that differences may reflect either neural or hemodynamic differences. Um, and that, in addition, um, the, the, uh, these baseline states can modulate the task-related response. And that, I think that's where things get complicated because we're actually not, there's additional complication is because there's, furthermore, there's a relationship between the resting state, neural, and the hemodynamic states. Okay, so you have these two things that are related that are both modulating the system, and we're really not sure what, what, where the modulation is occurring. So I think that sort of uh, complicates the inference, especially in cases where you've, you know there's a difference in, this, in the baseline physiological state, either because of disease, age, or medication. Um, okay, sorry, I'm a little late.